Would you please stand? Thank you. Well good, well, good morning to our service this morning. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, we have some visitors. Um, Sheena Smith's daughter and granddaughter, Elaine Dayton and Lucy, so welcome to you. And Gail Cresswell is visiting from Derby Boab Network, so welcome to our visitors and any others that I, whose names I don't have. And a special welcome to those wherever you may be, who are watching the service on the live stream. Uh, a couple of announcements. Um, uh, next Sunday is the last opportunity to return your uh, National Life, Church Life Survey. I'm presuming most of you have returned them, but please, if you haven't, please bring it next Sunday because we want everyone's... Um, input, uh, not only your views on, on the church as it stands now, but uh, the, on what you, your hopes and aspirations for the church of the future. So please don't um, forget to, if you, uh, we don't get your return, uh, form return next week, your views and opinions won't uh, be counted. Uh, the other um, exciting announcement is that we have now uh, selected a new uh, Office Administrator Secretary. Uh, her name is Marika Leonard, and she came to us with a very impressive CV and with um, all the qu uh, personal qualities and attributes that we were looking for uh, to fill that important role. So Marika will be starting uh, on the Tuesday after Anzac Day and uh, Kathy will be with her for a short while to um, ease her into the job. But as time goes by, you'll all have the opportunity to meet her, and I know you'll all make her very welcome. Thank you. I just want to give uh, foreshadowed information that we plan to have a recognition of Kathy's service on the 8th of May. Now that is Mother's Day, however um, we will do it in the service and over morning tea so that those who are here for the service and have to run off, uh, that at least gives you an opportunity. I want to say that. Um, Kathy's not been there this week, won't be there this coming week, won't be there next week, and if you think I'm slightly incompetent as a result, it shows you how much she, she has made me look good.
Peace be with you all. We come today at the beginning of Holy Week to remember some of the moments in the life of Jesus. So today we start with our Gospel reading. The Gospel reading is Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 40. Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethpage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered them, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. I have a question. If we only had Luke's gospel, what would we call today? Cloak Sunday Sunday has been suggested. Some people imagine Stone Sunday because Luke is the only one who says, if these people didn't cry out, the stones would cry out. It's interesting, isn't it, how when we read a particular witness to Jesus, we often import other material from other Gospels. We come today to the end of the Lenten journey now that Jesus has reached Jerusalem, although, as we heard, he he stopped just outside and then he entered the city. And if you know the events of the week, he kind of comes in and out of the city from the Mount of Olives. And during Lent, we have talked about Jesus, who talked about giving ourselves that we might find ourselves. And we've had this image of life flowing out through Jesus. In our slide uh, earlier in Lent, we showed a distance between the cross as the ultimate destination of Lent and the road. At that point, the road could have gone in other directions, yet Jesus continued to go towards Jerusalem. As we have had each Sunday of this season, the possibilities have narrowed. And on this Sunday, it's only a tiny little gap. So what we have seen is a decision, a choice that Jesus made to travel a particular road to Jerusalem, knowing what would happen there and nevertheless sticking to the purpose. 
Palms were used in various ways in ancient Judaism. The Psalm 118 speaks of bringing branches when you come to the temple. After the Maccabean revolt, when the Jews took Jerusalem again, palms were a sign of victory. So there are many things in the background of this image. However, Luke only speaks of them putting their cloaks. This is a reminder of the anointing of King Jehu. And after he was anointed, the people to show their acknowledgement of Jehu now as anointed king had put down their cloaks so that the king could pass over them. Let us pray. Oh God, we've started a little differently today. And that does things to us. What is familiar is slightly pushed aside. And we may feel discomfort. At the beginning of this holy week, O oh God, we turn to you for we know that the one we follow experienced great discomfort and yet held to the purpose that was before him. Meet us here, O oh God, as we come today. Enable us to be open to what you would speak Send your spirit upon us and among us and with us when we go that we may bear witness to the great love you have for us, for all people and all creation as we live as followers of Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Sorry, we have a bit of an issue today where our sound person is also reading. So uh, it's okay. It's a little different. It's a little uncomfortable. We're going to cope. God who comes in words of scripture. Come to us, we pray. The first reading is Isaiah chapter 50 verses 4 to 9. God's servant speaks. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he awakens, wakens my ear, to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. 
I did not turn backwards. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheek to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. He who will contend with, who will contend with me. Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? The Gospel reading, sorry, the second reading is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. But, he, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him, and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall, should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Show us your will, O God. Mostly when we're asked the name of this Sunday, we say Palm Sunday. It's interesting, isn't it, how that automatic response has been built up over time. It has very specific associations for many of us. 
And one of the things that kind of process illustrates is the way our automatic understanding works. We can't possibly keep everything and thoughts about every part of what we do in our mind all the time. We need our automatic thinking. It's valuable. And yet, it can also so shape us that we miss things. That we almost forget things. Our automatic ways of thinking and being are built up gradually over time. In a sense, they're the result of choices, although some of the earliest ones they're the result of the choices of parents rather than our own. Similarly, we have choices that come to us as a result of going to school and participate, participating in other institutions, including the church. The theme of choices struck me when I was thinking about our texts. The whole of the Lenten journey, as Luke tells it, is a choice to go to Jerusalem. A capital C choice, if you like. And along the way towards that destination, there are a whole series of, if you like, small C choices. In the background of the story is a variety of biblical texts. Not only when Jehu was anointed and they put their cloaks down, but also when the prophet Zechariah speaks of the coming of the Lord, he speaks of God coming to the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives was a place of significance. And it's no accident, I believe, that Jesus chose that location to be the place from which he entered the city. When David determined that Solomon would succeed him as king, he arranged for Solomon to ride his own donkey into the city over the Kidron Brook so that people might see, here is the new king on the old king's donkey. It was an affirmation that he came in the name and in the place of the king. All of this is in the background of the coming of Jesus. It's significant not only because Zechariah says, that it was a donkey, it's also a contrast. When the Romans depicted emperors, they did so on great war horses because emperors were imaged as conquerors, people with power, people who would use violence to exercise their will. This image of Marcus Aurelius is of one of the most kind emperors, but he was nevertheless a general and people knew the power that he had. In medieval tradition, they often made statues of Jesus on a donkey to pull in their processions. And it's a lovely story behind it because they tried at times to have processions, usually with the priest on the donkey. This is a bit worrying as I tell you this. <laughs> with the priest on the donkey. And donkeys didn't always like it. They didn't always keep the priest on the donkey's back. They sometimes didn't want to follow the route that people wanted them to follow. And sometimes they simply stopped stubbornly where they were, immovable. Donkeys make choices too. So they made these processional donkeys. 
that were compliant at least. And this is one of the most famous that was used yearly. What you can't see in that image is that it's on a board that could be put on a cart. This Sunday, our readings invite us to take a particular perspective on what happened. It invites us to put ourselves onto the back of the donkey. The first reading about the servant of the Lord who came in the name of the Lord is a reading about someone who sets determination, who sets his face like flint, who will not be deviated from the task. But there is something really striking about that one. First of all, it says in the text that the servant listens, makes a choice to turn to God. The servant learns as a result of listening and then is able to teach. To teach what? How to sustain the weary with a word. How to sustain the weary. This is not a Roman conqueror who comes on a donkey into Jerusalem. This is a figure of compassion, of love. The servant day by day, according to the prophet, tunes in to God, keeps on listening in order to be sure that the message is straight. However, notice those last few words. I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. There's a resoluteness that is there in the servant's behavior. Similarly, we have Paul. Paul who speaks of one who emptied himself and became a servant, who was obedient even unto death, death on a cross. Now these figures, the servant and Jesus as Paul conceives it, are figures who were making choices constantly. Day by day, it says of the servant. Moment by moment, if you like. My calling is to follow and to do what God seeks. I came across this week a story of Rachel Scott. You may or may not have heard of Rachel Scott. The picture on the right was taken in April 1999. As what we would call a primary school student, Rachel was a child with an eye for others. She would look out for those who were bullied. And she began a practice of making paper chains where the person who was kind to the bully and the person who needed the kindness were both written on a piece of paper and hung on the wall. And gradually over the year, as the acts of kindness were added, it created a chain. This found the attention of the principal of the school. The principals told the district and the district introduced that as a measure of countering bullying. What a lovely thought for a young woman to have come up with. 
Rachel was also a person of faith. I don't know which church she belonged to. However, she had a purpose built around choices. She wrote an essay in her teens entitled My Ethics, My Codes of Life. Look for the best in others. Dare to dream. Choose positive influences. Use kind words. Start a chain reaction of kindness. She was always for the underdog, I read. One of the ways she expressed it is in this saying, don't let your character change colour with your environment. Find out who you are and let it stay its true colour. Again, this image of self-awareness and making choices and building a character. Rachel was a young woman who had a sense that she would make a difference to the world. When she was in her early teens, not entirely with the approval of her parents, she drew her hands on a piece of furniture. These hands belonged to Rachel Joy Scott and will one day touch millions of hearts. Rachel Scott was probably the first of the school students shot at Columbine High School. There was a pattern her brother reported having been in the library and seeing people shot. The shooters first mocked the students and then shot them. Going through Rachel's possessions after her death, and in some of them they didn't open for up to a year, which is entirely understandable, she wrote this in her journal. Compassion is the greatest form of love humans have to offer. I have this theory that if one person can go out of their way to show compassion, then it will start a chain reaction of the same. People will never know how far true kindness will go. Rachel Joy Scott. A photo taken two days before she died. If you want to weep a bit this week, Google her name and look at parts of her funeral. Trying to find some meaning out of her death, her brother Craig and her father and other members of the family had begun a movement called Rachel's Challenge where they go around to schools and they talk to children about bullying. They invite them to think about expressing their appreciation for one another and for affirming one another. In other ways, in other words, they are inviting the students to cultivate choices which reflect compassion. This, I believe, is what our readings invite from us this week to take the view from the rider of the donkey. People might think of you as important, but for Jesus, the most important thing was that he would show love for people. Rachel Scott, in her youth, died at 17, had the mind of a servant. 
The choices she made included to cultivate awareness of others, to notice who's overlooked and try to include them, and in particular, to care for those who were bullied. Each little choice built up to develop a pattern and a character which has become part of her biggest influence. Choices, navigating our way. And I thought about Rachel as I was reading a particular part of the novel which I've been reading this week. And in the novel, an older man is driving a younger man and they stop at lights to allow a person with blindness to cross using a stick. And the driver says to the young man, what is he doing? And the young man said, he's working out where not to walk. Working out where not to walk. So often our choices are affirmative, but they also involve what not to do. When Paul wrote to the Philippians, he said, have this mind, the mind of Christ among you, Cultivate this mind, this way, this character, as you affirm that Jesus is the name above all names. Amen.
Confidence that God's generous blessings and care are extended to all humankind, we are bold to present these prayers for our own and the needs of the entire troubled and broken world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, on this Palm Sunday, we remember how Jesus entered Jerusalem to the sound of joyf joyful shouts. Let us, like the people of long ago, welcome our Messiah no less joyfully, but with the benefit of hindsight, give our humble thanks that he came in peace to suffer and die on the cross, that our lives might be set free. Thank you for what this day stands for, the beginning of Holy Week, the start of the journey towards the power of the cross, the victory of the resurrection, and the rich truth that Jesus Christ truly is our King of Kings. Loving God, we come to you in humility because we are not a perfect people. We know what is right and is required of us, and we earnestly desire to follow the way of Christ, yet all too often find his road too hard and too demanding. Forgive us for cheering Christ on his lonely road into Jerusalem when we take the easy way. We profess to love a humble saviour riding on a donkey, but we want the best things for ourselves and to honour without responsibility. We pray for a world caught up in a seemingly endless cycle of violence and conflict. Daily through the media we witness scenes of unimaginable suffering of innocent civilians and and especially pray for the oppressed people of Ukraine who are standing courageously against a cruel and heartless neighbour bent on the destruction of a sovereign country and its people. We think of the many millions of refugees who are the collateral damage of these conflicts and pray that the governments of the free world will open their hearts, coffers and borders to these poor forgotten souls upon whom the world tends all too often to turn its back. Today we pray for all who are tempted by power, for our political leaders and their followers who will do anything to stay popular, for those with great financial resources who only want to use it for themselves, for those with power over vulnerable people who harm those in their care. You know how each one of us is being tempted in our own life and in a moment of silence we meet you at our own crossroads. Feel your great tender love for us and listen to your voice. Grant us, Lord, a vision of your world as your love would have it a world where the weak are protected and none live in hunger, sickness, poverty or want of any kind. A world where the riches of creation are shared by all humanity, a world where different races and cultures and faiths live in harmony and mutual respect, a world where peace is built with justice and justice is guarded by love. Give us the inspiration and courage to build such a world through our Saviour Jesus Christ, and to God be the glory. This morning we particularly pray for the Wellington Regional Ministry comprising the Bunbury, St Augustine and Waterloo Uniting Churches and the Defence Force Chaplaincy. And in our own congregation we pray for the Ladies Book Club and the Know Your Bible Group. Like the people who greeted Jesus as he entered Jerusalem, and later pronounced, crucify him. We also are fickle people who often deny Christ in our thoughts, words and deeds and humbly pray for your forgiveness. As we journey with your son in this week of remembrance and hope, help us to understand you and your love for the world more clearly. Transform us by the saving knowledge of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and prepare us for service in your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. And now, Heavenly Father, gathering our prayers and praises into one, give us the grace to live according to your will 
through the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Palm Sunday in Jerusalem, the shouting gets louder, the noise swells to a roar. Hosanna is the cry of the crowd, blessings on him who comes in the name of the Lord. You are there that day, one of that great throng of people tightly packed together in the streets, waiting for Jesus to come. Can you hear their cheering? Look at the colour. Inside you feel excited and expectant, just like the rest of them. Oh God, here he comes now. Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, his people's redeemer, Jesus, the savior of the world. You join in the cheering as well, caught up in the excitement of the moment. You also shout Hosanna, blessings on him who comes in the name of the Lord. As Jesus passes, riding on the back of a donkey, he is smiling. For one brief moment, among all the people in that crowd, he catches your eye. No words are exchanged, but his look says everything. Because clearly, he understands how you feel. And under your breath, there are a few words you keep on repeating over and over again. You whisper them silently. Over and over again, some words that you want him to know. Say them to him now, as your eyes meet his. Say them to him now, as his eyes meet yours. Jesus has not heard your words. How could he? The noise is too great. The people are too many. The moment of meeting too short. But he has understood you all right. For the smile on his face breaks even wider. And the depth of his love for you shines in his eyes. And then he looks away. The donkey carries him on. Others like you will shout their praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessings on him who comes in the name of the Lord.
Let us pray. O oh God, this story touches us as we think of people we have known who have suffered and at times of our part in that suffering or ways in which we have held back. This story touches us as we think of the many busy aspects of that crowded city and we think of the many things which crowd our minds and memories which may keep us from what is central. The story touches us as we think of ways in which we are glad of affirmation and yet are not glad of the effort and energy that is required of us at times. In this mixture, O oh God, you come with love and compassion. You promise us forgiveness. You call us to be a forgiving and compassionate people. And we thank you that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. And that whatever we may feel at any particular moment, undergirding us always is your love and compassion. Hear us, for we pray in the name of the servant Christ. Amen. As far as the east is from the west, so far I have removed your sins from you, says the Lord. Hear the words of Jesus Christ for all of us. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. John Henson paraphrases the words of Paul to the church in Philippi. It's your relationship with Jesus that gives you strength. It's God's love which holds you when things go wrong. It's the Spirit who binds you in community. She gives you care and concern for one another. Now try to agree among yourselves and make sure no one goes short of love. Don't throw your weight about or scheme to get your own way. Regard everyone else as someone to cherish. Jesus, God's chosen, is your role model.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen.